thank you for coming to the Cook County Department of Public Health educational course about opioid overdose prevention and naloxone training. So our learning objectives for today's training is to understand the opioid overdose crisis that is going on here in Cook County, the state of Illinois, as well as the U.S. We'll learn how to identify and respond to opioid overdoses, as well as learn how to administer naloxone. So can anyone tell me what are opioids? There are painkillers, anti-inflammatories like Norco, Oxycontin, uh, things to that nature that actually relieve pain in, in people that have uh, very high levels of pain. Very true. Opioids are natural as well as synthetic substances that are used in, to interact with the brain and they're used as pain relievers. Anyone who gets exposed to them has the high risk of being able to be addicted to them. As seen in this chart, the opioid overdose pandemic has involved many overdose deaths that has been uh, rising six fold since 1999. And over the last few years, there has been a sharp increase between being synthetic as well as natural opioids that's leading to overdose deaths. As seen in this chart, opioid-related deaths in Cook County in the year of 2018, we saw 1,121 deaths throughout the whole county. In 2019, Cook County saw 1,227 deaths. As December 2020, Cook County has uh, reported so far, based on when this video was recorded, 1,771 overdose deaths. Looking into the different opioid-related deaths that happened in Chicago and Cook County, heroin is about 40%, while we're seeing a huge increase in fentanyl-related deaths throughout the years, as well as there's a small increase in pain relievers as well as methadone. So you may wonder, what is an overdose? Uh, opioid overdose occurs when there is an overwhelming amount of opioids onto the receptors in the brain and will cause breathing suppression and the person could possibly stop breathing. An overdose usually occurs anywhere between one to three hours after the person has ingested opioids. And with fentanyl, it may happen just a little bit faster. Some of the causes can be someone took a little bit too much of it than what was prescribed. They combined it with other uh, depressants such as alcohol and um, taking more than what their body can actually tolerate. So when an overdose happens, pretty much what it does is slows the breathing down to the point that breathing stops. Then there's a lack of oxygen that causes damage. The heart stops and then it can lead to the person having a seizure, a stroke, or even death. What increases the risk of an overdose? Switching between prescriptions, chronic medical conditions, discharge from a medical emergency room after an opioid overdose, mixing opioids with other substances, recent release from a detox program or incarceration. What are ways that we can prevent an overdose death? For people who have opioid prescriptions, is being able to take it as prescribed and not mixing it with other drugs or other alcohol. And for opioid users and their family members, is knowing where naloxone is and being able to administer it, as well as seek evidence-based treatment for substance use disorders. How can we distinguish an overdose from someone who is really high? For someone who might be uh, high, they're not necessarily experiencing an overdose. And then looking at these symptoms that we have listed here will let you know the difference between someone being extremely high versus overdosing. But if you are unsure at any time, please feel free to call 911 and start the process of administering naloxone. The difference between someone being really high and overdosing is the fact that the person becomes really relaxed when they're high compared to they are pale and clammy. The skin looks a little ashy depending on their uh, skin complexion. You have it where someone uh, might slow down a little bit as far as like their speech, 
It might get a little slurred when high compared to when they're overdosing. They are not speaking and the breathing has become infrequent or has stopped. The person might look a little sleepy compared to a deep snoring or gurgling sound when overdosing. They become responsive to uh, stirring or stirring rubs or any type of touch or speaking with them. Compared to when they're high, there's no response to stimuli at all. And they still have a normal uh, heart rate and pulse when they're really high compared to it's slowed or the heart rate has actually stopped in overdosing. And then the skin tone is still normal when they're really high compared to they start turning blue when they're overdosing. Our responses to overdose is number one, being able to recognize if it's an overdose or the person just being high. Two, being able to attempt to arouse. So doing stern rubs, any type of touching to see if the person responds. Number three is calling 911. Step four is administer naloxone and do rescue breathing with the person. And step five is to stay and help until help arrives, which is usually first responders. Why do we use naloxone? It's effective. Um, it helps in the cases of an overdose. And anyone can actually be trained in how to administer naloxone, which is what we're doing here today. And then it's, it's safe. So there's no way that you could potentially misuse or it becomes addictive. And it's almost like giving a person water if they were not actually overdosing. If someone wasn't taking opioid and they were given the locks out, it would not hurt them in any type of way. So what we would be doing today is going over how to actually administer the locks on. There are different steps in which you can do it. One is an injectable, which can easily be seen through these like this naloxone is a very small amount and we will go over how to use it today. Or you can also do a nasal injection which will go straight through the nostril. Your first step is to go up to the person, see if they're responding. Kathy, Kathy. Next, you see that the person isn't responding to anything, such as touch or being called by her name. What you would do afterwards is call 911. You would take a naloxone kit with you and then administer one of the uh, doses in her nose. Kathy, Kathy, are you okay? I think so. Sharice, Sharice, I don't think she's breathing. Let me call 911. Hello? I think one of my friends is experiencing an overdose. Can you please send a paramedic? Thank you. You're going to uh, pour about one milliliter into the syringe, pour it out. You will go to the person and go for a meaty spot, such as the arm or the thigh area. You inject. And then you will wait two to three minutes to see if the person responds. Always remember that you do not need to remove anyone's clothes while administering the locks on unless they have on thick outer material, such as a coat. If the first dose does not work, in two to three minutes, you could give the person a second dose. We're hoping in time, first responders would be there to work with the person after the second dose. If the person is still not responsive, make sure to lay them in the recovery position 
and on that side to prevent choking while waiting for help. What occurs after you give naloxone to an individual? Stay with them as long as possible. Some people are not willing to go to the hospital to seek medical care afterwards. So it's just making sure that someone's with them afterwards so there's not a reoccurrence of an overdose. If the person is still not responsive, put them in the recovery position. If the person is responsive, they might be confused after what has occurred. In this time, you will tell them what occurred, stay with them if you are the person that they're comfortable with, and then you want to comfort this person during that time period. During the time that you administer naloxone to a person, either as an injectable or as a nasal, if the person still is not responding, we would do rescue breathing. That includes looking to see if there's anything in the person's airway that could be blocking them from breathing. So you will open the person's mouth and check to make sure that there's no food or anything that's in there blocking their breathing. You place one hand on the person's chin to tilt it at about 90 degree angle. You pinch their nose so then the airway that you're working on is directly through the mouth. You will place your mouth over the person's mouth and give them two quick breaths. If the person is responding to that, that's when you would do chest compressions. Is it possible to administer too much naloxone? It's not possible to administer too much naloxone. Actually, there are different levels depending on the way that you administer naloxone, that it's the melodosis that's given to someone. However, that there are going to be times that someone's going to be administering naloxone more than twice. Can you tell me about the difference between the two naloxone brands? Narcan is the actual brand name, the uh, trademark name of naloxone. Naloxone is a generic drug, however, it is used in several different ways. Do people that are administered naloxone, do they always have to go to the hospital? People don't always have to go to the hospital after being administered naloxone. However, it is strongly recommended that they seek medical care. If they are not going to receive medical care, then at least have some type of supervision throughout that time. If we're in administering in injectable naloxone, do we need to switch up the sites that we're injecting it in if we're administering multiple doses, or is it okay to just go in one spot the whole time? You can continue to use naloxone in the area which you did the first dose. If you feel comfortable just doing arms or you feel comfortable just doing the thigh area, you do not have to change arms or directions. You can stay in the same place.